Right guys, welcome back to our next video. As promised, it's a comparison between the 500 and the standard three door. So picture the scene, it's August 1987. You spend your weekends up and down South End Seafront, blaring out the pet shop boys. And uh, you fancy a new motor. You've just seen this video or this advert on the TV. Sierra. They said the car would break, it hasn't done that, they've broken the spirit of the opposition. Meantime, the race leader. We are the we are the and everything has run so superbly today for the Rudy Eggenberger Ford Texaco. We are the And you decide to head down to your local Ford dealership where you're presented with what look like two identical cars. Now, little did you know that the RS500s had just been homologated and are now in the showrooms. So what exactly are the differences? Do you go with a standard three door, which has been, you know, everybody has raved about it for the last two years, three years, or do you go with the RS500? So I think we need a dodgy salesman to come and tell us the difference. Right then, Sonny. So you're fancying a new car, are you? I am, but what's the difference and what's the cost? The easiest bit first, the Sierra Cosi, when it was released, 14,995. Nothing for a man of your saliva, as I can <laughs> see. Or you could pay the extra five grand, 19,995, and you could have the all singing, all dancing RS500. I think we'd best go through the uh, important bits. How fast is it? Which one's quicker? that's the the worst question you can ask because <laughs> there was virtually nothing in it there was three or four miles an hour difference top speed on the 500 but realistically because the 500 was so drastically detuned or its potential wasn't reached should i say there wasn't a great lot of difference in the speed so a lot of people struggled to see the extra five thousand quid that it cost you for the rs 500 because what we've got to remember when these were released these were done for a purpose to homologate the race cars so the race cars hadn't actually proven their worth yet nobody realized just how phenomenal they were going to be as a race car so realistically what did you get for the extra five grand well, we'll in this video we'll try and go through it and show you right what we'll do we'll start with the the obvious bits that most people notice um visual differences should i say so the RS500 obviously had a different front bumper. Now what most people think on the front bumper is it's just that cut out there. That's the only difference. Well, like it isn't. And once we show you, I hope it becomes more obvious what the difference is. Luckily with the three door next, it's easy to compare. So not only did it have that cut out, which allowed for extra cooling for the larger intercooler, which we'll talk about in a minute. These cutouts here were actually made that much wider on each side so if we jump straight over to the Sierra, standard sierra you can see there where the number plate recess is the mouth openings we call them finish there and back to the 500 again you can see the number plate recess finishes but the the mouth's open wider so a difference not a lot of people noticed obviously again most people notice the grills these again were homologation only as everything was on the 500 and these were there simply to allow ducting so that the race cars could have a pipe that sat behind where the fog light went to aid cooling to the to the front brakes so again they came but they didn't actually replace the fog light as such because when you bought the car the fog lights were in the boot in a box and they put them in there for you because a lot of people wanted to put the fog lights back in um, so you got them with the car obviously standard three door came with the fog lights always the other big difference or the one the expensive thing that most people notice is the front splitter you can see it's a plastic material rather than the rubber on the standard three door and instead of just coming straight down it actually has a lip on it and also returns right down the side of the bumper as you'll see there 
and comes up the side of the bumper as again if we revert back to the standard three door you can see it's just a, a smaller rubber but only comes around the front so that's the front bumper covered if we go to the back of the car we'll see the other main differences now what we've got here on the 500 the spoiler was basically all the same size and shape but what they did they added this extra lip on the rear here that's known as the gurney flap it's called that because the gentleman who invented it i believe he was an american in the 70s or something like that um, it was named after him as he invented it for a, an older race car and this has been carried on for years and years so we've got the extra lip there and then also we have the lower rear spoiler that was fitted as an extra on the rs500 now these spoilers were fitted to some i believe european cars as standard but they had to put a cut out in the rear spoiler there to allow it to sit up to the leg of the middle spoiler now again there is a people think that that was just cut out with a Stanley knife it actually wasn't this is a special one-off spoiler with a separate part number so what we'll do we'll put a picture up for you to see so you'll see the extra part number but again unique to the RS500 on the boot you see it says Sierra RS500 Cosworth and on the standard Sierra it just says Sierra RS Cosworth something interesting to know that if you see an RS 500 that's never had any paint work the RS 500 there was just added on it wasn't a unique new sticker they added the RS 500 and simply peeled off the RS there so when you see an RS 500 for, that's never been painted from you what you'll spot, notice is that that RS 500 is a slightly different colour giving all the trade secrets away here aren't we but yeah you, you can clearly see it when you see a car that's never had any paint work and then the only other thing on the outside is the famous RS 500 pinstripe these again were fitted at Tickford just a simple nice pinstripe with the RS 500 logo on the front wings all right so what you're saying is that it's an extra five thousand pounds more than this sierra cosworth behind me now bear in mind currently in the uk on average i can buy an house for twenty nine thousand pounds what i want to know is where is my five thousand going because currently all i can see is a fancy front bumper and an extra rear wing well let's get into the real nitty-gritty follow me right then i don't know where to start i suppose what people think is the people that know a little bit about sierra cosworth will tell you that it's just an eight injector inlet manifold and a bigger turbo so we'll start with them on the rs500 as we said you've got eight fuel injectors you've got four on the top rail which is the same as a standard sierra cosworth but then you have four extra injectors that are mounted on the side of the inlet plenum which is completely different. The whole inlet plenum structure is completely different than it is on a standard Sierra. You've obviously got two sets of fuel rails to provide the fuel to them. You have to loop the fuel system to get the fuel down to the second rail and then it's linked back at this point. And well, what we run on the 500 is a much larger throttle body. So the throttle body ID, sorry, OD is 76 millimetres, which correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 52 on the standard Sierra. So you've got a hell of a lot bigger throttle body, allowing a lot more air to get in to match with the extra injectors. Now, one thing that most people don't realize is the second set of injectors on the road car is not connected. They never were at factory. And it's simply a plug that sits behind the battery like that, that does absolutely nothing. It is there again for what we call homologation purposes. Now what homologation means, if a manufacturer wants to race cars, motorbikes, whatever it may be, back in the day you couldn't build a one-off bike or car. It had to be a production vehicle. So what they had to do, if they wanted to run a slightly bigger car, more horsepower, etc., 
they had to build a minimum of 500 road cars to make the homologation and the homologated car had to have all the parts fitted to it that you could buy from the showroom fitted to the car that were going to be fitted to the race car so hence the, this road car had to have the eight injectors it had to have the wiring and the injectors had to be present but they didn't actually have to work but they had to be present so that's why those were never connected so that's the fuel side system done. I don't know whether it's probably easy if we show you jump to the Sierra here. You can see there we've only one set of injectors. The second fuel rail is completely missing. The actual inlet plenum itself is a lot thinner because it doesn't carry the volume of air that is required for the RS500 and it's got the smaller throttle body and the idle speed control valve is in a different position because they had to turn that and relocate it on the RS500 to get the second set of injectors in. I think that's quite easy to see. While we're on the three door, you can see there this is a standard T3, quite a small turbo that was fitted to this standard Sierra Cosworth and the Sapphire Cosworth was on a T3. On the RS500 again, they wanted to run really big boost levels on the race cars, so they, they fitted the T4 turbo. Now the difference here is this turbo can produce a 550 horsepower, totally standard. The little turbo on the, on the standard Sierra, you, you can run big horsepower out of it, but it won't last very long. That's probably good for 230, 240 horsepower continuous use before it fails, as again, 550. So a big difference there. The water system on the two cars was completely reworked. You'll see on the standard Sierra Cosworth there, all we have is one outlet one outlet pipe that goes to the top of the radiator and then returns back into the water pump. On the RS500, you can see there, there's a completely reworked water system where the, the, the return is back in through a much larger, a much bigger capacity thermostat housing with a bleed nipple on both sides, on the in and the out of that. Now the radiator was standard that was exactly the same, but because of the difference in the thermostat housing meant all the water pipes are different, they're not the same. So the, every single water pipe under this bonnet is different to a standard Sierra Cosworth, apart from the two at the back that go to the um, eater, matrix. eater matrix, that's the word. So they're the same, every other one is different. Another big difference you can see is the boost hoses. Now, obviously, again, because of the bigger diameter throttle body, they had to rework these 76 mil. So a lot bigger and made out of a completely different material, a lot, lot more heavier duty, a lot more heat resistant um, boost hoses, all come with special part numbers on them. You can see that one, the other two are underneath, so you can't see those. But I think we all recognize them as RS500 because of, of the color. Um, but it's not just the colour, totally different uh, setup altogether. Now, one thing you'll have heard everybody say on, on the Sierra Cosworth as they grew over the time, I fitted an RS500 intercooler. What the difference is, again, on the RS500, uh, a massive, huge front mount intercooler. So it comes right up under the bonnet landing panel here, and it's full length of the car. It comes right to the bottom of the bumper. So the intercooler... Is full height of the front of the car and full width to about here behind the headlights. They had to actually move the headlights slightly to get the big intercooler in when these were fitted at Tickford. So there's one of the major big differences. Allows obviously when you're running 550 plus horsepower, you need to keep them air temperatures down. So that intercooler is essential as opposed to on the standard Sierra. All we've got here is a really really quite small you'll actually see well because the grill's missing out of it you can see it only goes usually what four or five inches deep again worked but only good for maybe 250 horsepower maximum what else have we got the airbox a lot of people again don't realize the difference on the airbox because of the larger 76 mil boost pipes the airbox had to have a wider opening to allow for the bigger boost pipes but also what most people don't notice if you look there you can see the top of the airbox is flat what they did they raised the airbox lid 
I made it flat again for a lot more capacity air. If you look back at the standard three door, you'll see here where it's not level, it's dropped down slightly. It's not flush and obviously a lot smaller boost pipe fitted so that can't hold as much air as the RS500 version. You'll also notice the air intake on this Sierra here is different to the 500. It has what we call a snorkel and this is the air intake pipe and you can see the width of it. It basically slots above the intercooler and is spread halfway across to allow for a lot more volume of air to come in through the grill and be dragged in through this bigger snorkel to fill this bigger air box. So again, a unique item to the RS500. The map sensor bracket, that had to be reworked on the RS500 because of the repositioning of the throttle body. They had to move the map sensor further back so that a special unique bracket was made for the map sensor to allow that to sit in its um, non-standard position. Another thing to do with the turbo, because of the heat that built up under the bonnet of these cars with the huge turbo, they had to redesign the heat shield and they made it out of fiberglass, a real thick, heavy duty fiberglass material and made it bigger to sit further away than the turbo. And also on the RS500, you'll notice there's this big heat protection that stuck onto the back of the bonnet. That was done only on the RS500s. You'll see there on the standard three door, it has nothing. And you can see the difference in the much smaller turbo heat shield on there. Right then, another couple of little things before we get into the money items. You'll see there the RS500 has this, what we call commonly as a crossover pipe. Uh, the dump valve is in the same place on the 500 as it is on the standard three door. But on the three door, this returns into the intercooler and then passes through the intercooler. On the 500, what they did was put this link pipe in to make it a direct feed straight in closer to the throttle body. Um, so that's, again, unique to the 500. One other thing I didn't mention was the alternator. Now, the alternator is a standard alternator, but because of the much larger turbocharger, it would hit the alternator. So they had to lower that further down, and they did that by means of what's commonly known as a drop bracket, which is simply a piece of uh, steel with the holes relocated further down so that the alternator could sit approximately maybe three inches further down than on a standard three-door cars with. Right, now something you're going to have to take my word for because we can't see it in the car. The main difference in an RS500 under the bonnet is the engine block. Now what Ford did was obviously they'd done testing on these engines and knew what kind of performance they needed to achieve and they wanted big numbers for the period which was 500 plus brake horsepower. They'd done testing on the standard block in the standard Cosworth and it just simply couldn't take it. The blocks would split and crack so they knew they had to beef up the engine block. So on the RS500 it's got a 205 block which is there's a 205 block in the standard Sierra and this is where it gets complicated but the 205 block in the RS500 was a much stronger thicker wall block and one of the other the main differences which you can't see when it's in the car is the core plugs on the core plugs on the 500 they're a lot smaller they're probably about half the size of the R on the standard 205 Cosworth block so unless you really really know what you're looking for it's very difficult to see the differences when you know you know so be careful if you're ever offered what you believe to be a genuine RS500 stronger block, you need to do your own work on it. What we'll do if we've got a block in the workshop, we'll show you the smaller car plugs to give you some sort of help with that. And the cylinder head again was unique to an RS500. The reason for that was on we touched on the differences between the thermostats on the two engines well on the 500 thermostat it's, it's called a three bolt thermostat so it has three bolts located in a triangle to mount that thermostat on on the standard sierra cosworth it's only got two a much smaller thermostat so they had to alter the water system in the head and also again for homologation purposes they knew that on the race cars they were going to have to open the inlet ports massively to get a better flow of fuel and air in so 
they had to do it on the RS500 road car. But if they'd have done it all the way down the inlets, the car wouldn't have run correctly in standard form. So what they did, they only machined a small amount just into the cylinder head to meet the size diameters they required, but they didn't machine it all the way in so that the road car in standard form would still perform reasonably well. But again, you have to take the inlet manifold off to see that because also the inlet manifold is what we call doweled. <coughs> Calm down. <laughs> so on the inlet manifold, you've got two dowels on cylinders one and four that are drilled into the cylinder head and you've got the dowels into the inlet manifold that locate the manifold in the exact right position so all the parts line up perfectly. But again, you can't see that with, with um, the engine built up. So I don't think we've missed anything. There will be something, no doubt, something small we've missed. But as you can see, the differences are a lot more than people think. It isn't just the turbo and the inlet manifold. All the hoses, intercooler, air boxes, brackets, everything is different. Um, so we hope that helps. If you're looking for a 500, um, do your own work and make sure you get the right one. The only good thing with an RS500, we won't show you this because this isn't our car, but they have a unique chassis number and the chassis numbers have to fall within a certain range to be a genuine 500 chassis number. Um, we will give you the range. We'll put that down on the end of the video so you know the range to look for. Um, and again, that really is the only true way of identifying a genuine 500. Now, we've touched on everything externally. We've touched on everything under the bonnet. The only thing on the suspension wise that's different, we hear all these myths about the, the brakes are different, they're not. The suspension's different, it's not. The interior changes, it doesn't. Everything is absolutely, totally stock in that respect, other than what we've told you about. The only thing that's different is the rear beam on the back. Now, this confuses the heck out of a lot of people, so I'll try and explain that as best we can. So I've got a bracket here. Now, on the Sierra Cosworth on the back rear beam, the rear beam is a totally stock standard Sierra Cosworth item. What they wanted to do for the race cars was allow a different geometry set up for the rear beam, for the rear arms. They wanted to move the pickup point 90 mil further forward. So to get around that was a simple bracket that they made, and this is it. This is what is fitted to the rear beam on a Sierra RS500 Cosworth. You'll see that hole there. All they did was took the nut off from the inner arm on the trailing arm. They slid that bracket on. They put the nut back on. And then on the other side, they put one little tack. There you can see where it's been broken off. That tack was just basically to hold that bracket in place. And what that did was they met the homologation so that you could move that hole, the mounting pickup point, further forward by 90 millimetres. That's all that does. You cannot use that bracket. It is only a temporary fixed item just to meet the homologation. So when you look under the rear end of a Sierra RS500, which people do to check its originality, it should have that simple fabricated bracket bolted and tacked onto the rear arm. But don't be frightened if it's not there, because unfortunately, like this car that this came off, if you fitted an aftermarket exhaust system, often, especially with the Scorpions, you couldn't get it on for this bracket. One of the mounting arms on the rear, uh, the centre section of the exhaust, used to hit this. So they simply took the nut off, broke the weld, took that bracket off, either threw it in the skip or threw it in the boot of the car, and did away with it. So there are a lot of RS500 genuine cars with that bracket missing. But what we'll do to try and simplify it, we'll now go into the workshop, we'll show you underneath of a race car, and we think that'll explain this system a little bit easier. Right then, what we've got the bracket with us, so what we're gonna try and do is um, give you some rough idea of how this works. So this is the bracket we spoke about, and it is located there on a standard rear beam. So you can see there, that's the mounting point for the, for the rear arm on a race car, which lines up with this bolt here. The original mounting point for a standard Cosworth is somewhere here, which is 90 mil further back from there. So you can see where this has been cut and you can see where they've strengthened it there 
and where they fabricated this extra piece to move that further forward. And that is purely the reason for this bracket to allow that to happen on the race cars. So I, I hope that makes a little bit of sense out of what this bracket was for. All right, well, I think I'm a bit closer to making a decision on which one I want to drive away. But uh, just a few questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So first of all, what colours, if I go for a 500, what colours can I buy it in? Well, unfortunately, you're stuck with exactly the same colour combination as you do with the standard three-door cars. With You've got your Moonstone blue, your black and your white. Now, there is a bonus, depending on what colour you like, because there were only... There is not an equal number of same colours. If you want a Moonstone Blue one, you're going to buy the rarest of the, of the lot. There was only 50, uh, 52 ever made in Moonstone Blue. The next to that is 56, which was the white cars, which ironically there was only 52 made in white, but we also had the original four prototype cars were also made in white. And the prototype cars, which was never heard of before, were actually included in the 500 build so you have got four more white ones and then if you want the black one 392 okay so you mentioned obviously that this one's got the bigger turbo so am i going to notice a difference to how it drives on the road is this am i going to need to drive this one harder and rev it harder to get the same performance out of it as i would with that one yeah you, you wear everybody going on about turbo lag on rs500 as well yeah it's there um, the boost doesn't come on to these till about just over 4,000 revs and these start to boost just over sort of two to two and a half thousand so this picks up a lot quicker this is simpler and easier to drive there's no doubt about it than the laggy T4 but this is more fun once you get out on the open road you get your foot down this keeps pulling as this runs out of steam this keeps pulling so there's pros and cons to both it's, it's down to personal choice really yeah, yeah. Something else I was wondering, um, parts, you know, if this inlet plenums, there's only 500 of them. <laughs> if I need another one, am I going to be able to get one? Obviously, we're talking now hypothetically as though we were back in period. Obviously, when these cars were brand new, you could still go to a Ford dealer and buy anything off the shelf. In reality today, you're going to struggle to find the parts. And if you do, you're going to pay big, big money for them. Yeah. I mean, especially now that the race series is of techno for these cars, the historic race series has seen the uplift in values because everybody's building race cars again or replicas and they want, they have to have the homologated part. So you will pay through the nose for them. Mm -hmm. All right. So going back to 1987, which one personally would you buy? I think back in the day when you could buy them both brand new, it's a tough decision because, like you say, £5,000 bought you a lot then. This was, when it came out, a, a game changer. No manufacturer had ever made a car in this car's price bracket that was as fast, uh, you know, looked as, as outrageous as what it did because we have to say that, you know, a lot of flack was made for the three-door race spoiler. They had the bonnet vents, which was like one of the first cars ever to have vents in the bonnet and... These were just amazing cars, mm -hmm. absolutely, and instantly iconic. There's no doubt about it. They were radical. They were just absolutely fabulous. And they're still out of day. There's no doubt about it. They're still an absolutely brilliant car. But obviously today, the RS500 people would slightly favour over a three-door, only because it's rare. Yeah. It's got a build number. It's, it's only built as 500 cars. So collectors would probably go for that but saying that most collectors usually have both mm -hmm. they want the iconic three-door Cosworth which has still got credibility today still iconic car and I think most people would like both but obviously value wise the 500 is a lot more money but saying that the three doors in good condition you still won't get a nice one for much less than 50 grand yeah I mean if you look at the you know there's five grand difference between these in 87 it's probably somewhere around £20,000 difference now. These have obviously climbed to a big, much greater difference in today's money than what they were originally. Yeah, they are, but I think it's the same. 
I think to be fair, because that's a limited edition of the 500, it's in the same category as your, your, your Mitsubishi Evos, yep. you know, all your wide body 80s cars, your Audis, your Lanciers and, and, and all that kind of thing. The 500, the, the Sierra was an, a, a fabulous car. The 500 just tipped over yep. into that iconic 80s supercar bracket, really. And I think that's why these demand the money now that they do. It, 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 just because of that special edition yeah. fact. It's not because it's particularly a much better car, it's just the rarity value yeah. to it. Where do you see the values going of both cars then? Do you think <laughs> the gap between the two will get bigger or do you think the gap will go up evenly? Or I, I, I genuinely believe, and again, this is nothing against the three door, uh, the fabulous cars. I genuinely do believe we will see a million pound RS500. <laughs> If I may, I spoke years ago and said that we would see an RS500 meet £100,000. And I got absolutely slated by people on the internet. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You're living in, you know, you're too passionate about them. hundred grand today, nobody bats an eyelid. You know, a hundred grand does not buy you a perfect example RS500 yeah. anymore. It buys you a good example, not a perfect example. We've seen one already sell for a few pound under £600,000. Did I think it would achieve that? Not now. I, I, I believed it would, but I, I didn't think it would be this soon. But I genuinely do believe we will see a million pound RS500. I think these will continue to climb. I think they will always follow the RS500 because there's a place for them. And I think the people who haven't got the money that 500s demand are more than happy to have a yeah. standard three door without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. So one of the other things that gets mentioned quite a lot is that these cars were built by Tickford. They were. Quite, did they work on the Aston Martins and stuff like That's that? That's correct. Well? Tickford was a specialist vehicle builders. And Ford approached Tickford and asked them to do the conversions because not a lot of people realise that all RS 500s actually left the factory exactly like this car as a standard three-door Sierra Cosworth. The reason for that is Ford had obviously done a lot of development work in the background and realised that they needed to build these cars to, to get the touring cars at the front of the grid. And it was virtually impossible because the three-door was actually coming to the end of its program, its end of its build, and the Sierra Sapphire Cosi had already been developed. You know, it was due to go into production. So what do they do? They, they can't really revamp a full factory to make a limited run of 500 cars. So they approached Tickford and said, will you build these cars for us? Tickford agreed. So what basically happened, and this is the reason for why there's an odd number of colours of cars, because originally, when the program was talked about, all the RS 500s were in fact going to be painted silver, so that they were completely separate and unique to all the other Sierra Cosworths. But they, they quickly looked at the calculations and said, we, we, "We cannot possibly put 500 more body shells into production to build them silver on the line. It just wasn't feasible." So they decided to pull all the last 500 cars that were already in the factory; they were already in build. They left them a standard three-door Cosworth and they basically just said, right, from the last car, they counted forward 500 cars, minus a couple that were already built as the prototypes. That car is the first of the 500 production run. From that car backwards, they all go off to then the transport to Tickford on low loaders as standard three-doors and were converted by Tickford Motors. The engine were taken out. All the bodywork changes were made. They did every single conversion on the car to turn it into an RS500. I think some of that we've not mentioned yet is that the 500 was all solely road cars. A lot of people think that a lot of the 500s became race cars. Yeah, they do. Yeah, good point. Um, the race cars were not built out of road cars. The reason for that is basically the only thing you would have used would have been the body shell and the engine. You wouldn't have you and the intercooler and pipe work. So what, race cars were always built out of Ford Motorsport parts. So Ford Motorsport produced a, a lightweight body shell with no sunroof in it, ready for teams to buy, 
go and put it in the workshop, seam weld it, put a roll cage in it, and all the group air parts, the specific suspension parts and everything, were all available through an RS dealer, through a, a major dealer, you could go and buy everything. So none of these that we know of were ever converted into full-blown group air race cars. And I think the reason behind that is because obviously at 20,000 quid, we've touched on it was a lot of money back in 87 you could build probably two th a third of the car for that budget anyway so for the amount of parts you wouldn't use it wasn't worth it i think last question that i'm obviously interested to hear on is as of now today where do you think these cars belong do they belong out on the road do they belong out in showrooms or people's collections where would you like to see these well i think it, we all like to see them on the road don't we there's nothing better than to see one on the road but i do fully understand people who buy them as collector's items when you're paying a hundred plus for a car it's difficult to use it isn't it and i think that as the values rise we will see less and less of them we're starting to see less and less of the standard three doors now very rare you see them on the road and unfortunately, as values rise, I think we'll see less and less of them. Yeah. But uh, that's the way it is, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that kind of rounds up our video today, does it? I think so. If anybody has got any questions that, you know, we haven't covered anything we've missed, by all means, drop it in the comments and we will try and answer it for you. But I think we've done our best to try and show the differences between the two cars. And hopefully you might have learned a thing or two with a bit of luck. Right, well, I think I've made my decision and I'm going to take that one on. Give us your money. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that's it then, guys. Thanks very much, as usual, for tuning in. Um, we really do appreciate it. And hopefully you'll join us on our next video that Steve's already on with editing and putting together, which we believe will be quite a big one on the paint process for yep. the, the race car we're building. Um, so, yeah, keep a lookout for that one. And... Uh, Thanks again for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Yeah, and one last thing I forgot to say was we would like to thank Kim um, for allowing us to use his three-door Cosworth and Conrad for the use of his RS500. Without the use of these cars, we couldn't do these videos. So thanks very much, guys. We appreciate it.